When the Templin Institute investigates the nations, factions, and organizations of alternate worlds, we usually need to focus on the tangible details, facts and dates, structures and capabilities, all the factors that are the most straightforward to dissect and discuss. Harder to analyze is something like institutional culture, the shared values, behavior, and norms that shape the character of any organization, elements like professionalism, competence, ethics, integrity, cohesion, accountability, and a clearly defined mission or values are all incredibly important, but also difficult to measure. And when they're working the way they're supposed to, they're almost invisible. But when institutional culture is neglected, you end up with a scene like this. Were you ever in the war, Senator? No. Just sat back and waited to see who came out on top? Compared to many workplace meetings or holiday dinners, this probably seems rather tame. But the conduct of General Harris and Dula, displayed here in speaking with New Republic Senators, really makes my skin crawl. And on this episode of Incoming, I want to explain why that is. So let's quickly recap what's going on here. After an incident with Imperial Loyalists, Hera is requesting that a task force be sent to the Deneb system in order to gather more information on the possible return of Grand Admiral Thrawn. Hera's audience is mostly unreceptive to her arguments, so she calls out the especially hostile Senator Ziono. There's a lot we could criticize here. It seems odd for senators to be so involved in what is essentially a minor incident, and Hera's report on that incident is about a sentence long before the conversation turns to speculation and requests, all without any real explanation or evidence. Hera spends more time talking about her dumb kid than she does explaining her position. On the other side of things, Senator Ziono seems more concerned with personal attacks and pushing his own agenda than actually listening to what's being said. This is a wide-reaching conversation that moves from internal security to foreign threat assessment to requests for a military intervention, and it's all handled with the same attention and depth as an idle chit-chat. There's no deliberation or analysis, and the actions of everyone in the room just seems to undermine the seriousness of the issue at hand. But that's not really what I want to focus on. Because when you strip out all these little incongruous details and instead focus on the basic dynamic of this meeting, what we're really seeing playing out is one of the most important relationships that can exist in a democratic society. The interplay between a civil government and its military. It's often complicated, and it can be easily strained. But the importance of that relationship should never be discounted. One of the defining characteristics of a sovereign state is its monopoly on the use of force. As the primary wielder of that force, military institutions inherently possess immense power. Historically, a nation's own army has often been the greatest threat to its own stability. A dictator might try to solve this problem by ensuring the military is loyal to them above all else. This is a great solution for the dictator, but not so much for the military or the nation. Promoting people based on their loyalty rather than their merit can lead to cronyism, it fosters corruption, and can destroy a military from the inside just as thoroughly as any external battlefield defeat. Fasari may have tolerated you, Stahl, but I am not Fasari. Hmm, unfortunately, that is abundantly clear. Democracies, by contrast, can adopt a more functional approach, one that maintains the capability of their armed forces while anchoring them in firmly democratic values and principles. What the fuck are you even doing here? Sir! I got lost on the way to college, sir! In this system, Military power is expressly subordinate to elected civilian leadership. There are robust systems of accountability and oversight, and most importantly, the military is an apolitical entity dedicated to serving the nation rather than any individual or party. This doesn't mean that any senator or elected official can boss a general around. It instead creates a clear hierarchy where the armed forces are responsive to civilian oversight, but not subject to the whims of individual politicians. But for this kind of system to actually work, the armed forces require a strong institutional culture. Military leaders at every level have to understand and embrace their role within the democratic framework of the nation. Officers cannot just be tacticians and strategists. They are custodians of the principles and values upon which the nation is founded. Because of this, active members of the armed forces are often held to a higher standard in this regard than civilians, and that standard rises exponentially with their rank. Captain Sobel? Major Winters? Captain Sobel! 
We salute the rank, not the man. So armed with that bit of added context, let's revisit that meeting between General Hera and the Senators. A civilian government is exercising its responsibility to provide oversight and accountability over the military. This is not a bad thing. But Sindula doesn't seem to respect the importance of this relationship. As soon as she is confronted with even the most minor pushback on claims even she admits had very little evidence, she becomes frustrated and resorts to a personal attack against a Senator. Now this is such a minor remark but it carries with it enormous implications purely because of who is saying it and who it's being said to. For a general to speak to an elected official this way, any official, is an attack on democratic principles and compromises the professional neutrality of the armed forces. This isn't just a snide remark against a hostile senator. In this context, it has to be taken as a broader disregard for the entire democratic process. In a small but important way, comments like this can delegitimize every elected official. This does not excuse the conduct of Senator Ziono. I am of the opinion that as a general, Hera is entitled to the same level of respect afforded to senators, but we need to remember that this relationship is not equal. Of the two people trading thinly veiled insults, one has been trusted with the responsibility of directly exercising the state's monopoly on force, the other has not. But it's not just the fact that a New Republic general insulted a senator during an official meeting, it's the language she chose. The implication is clear. By not serving in the rebellion against the Empire, Ziono is being subtly accused of lacking moral authority and first-hand experience. Hera is trying to redirect the conversation in a way that sidelines any meaningful debate in favor of some hierarchy of legitimacy based on personal history rather than a democratic mandate. But patriotism is not the exclusive domain of military veterans, and Hera is wrong to wield it as a weapon like this. Not everyone fights for what they believe in by grabbing a blaster. And just because a person didn't fight in a war, it doesn't mean they weren't affected by it, or that they don't have a valuable perspective and contribution to make in shaping policy. And while this was going on, there was someone else in that room who more than anyone else should have understood all of this. Someone who should have recognized Hera's remark for the thuggish attempt at bullying it was and the danger of its implications. I'm so disappointed this person sat by and said nothing while well, everything she believed in was attacked, even indirectly like this. But one group that I'm sure will have plenty to say about all this are the conspiracy theorists. Some will certainly try to bring up the claim that Hamato Ziono is in fact an agent of the First Order and is trying to undermine the New Republic from within. And to them I say, I served with Hamato Ziono, Hamato Ziono is a friend of mine, and you're no Hamato Ziono. That was really uncalled for, Senator. But in the interest of fairness, let's imagine for a second that all these accusations are true, and Ziono is trying to advance the interests of the First Order. Does that change anything? No. The political beliefs of a senator, elected in accordance with the laws of the New Republic, should carry no weight in how military representatives interact with them in an official capacity. If there is evidence of corruption or criminal activity in the Senate, there should be systems and procedures in place to deal with it, and those should be entirely separate from the military. It is not Hera's job to police the activities of senators, nor should it be. Why is that? Well, Hera might not understand her role within a democratic system, but there is another military leader who does. You have the only armed, disciplined force available. Yeah, but I'm not gonna be your policeman. There's a reason why you separate military and the police. One fights the enemy of the state, the other serves and protects the people. When the military becomes both, and the enemies of the state tend to become the people. Now, if all Hera had done was mutter at some jerk in some Senate meeting, I think the Templin Institute could let this slide. People, even generals, are allowed to have bad days, apologize, and be done with it. But Hera escalated this and disregarded orders. The senators rejected her request to enter the Danab system, so she did it anyways. And when she was threatened with a court-martial, as she absolutely should have been, this was her defense. This is a government and it has rules and laws which General Sindula seems to have no problem bending to fit her personal agenda. My job is to protect the people of this republic. And that is exactly what I was doing. In the best way I know how. I see. And you protected the New Republic by ignoring direct orders. No, I protected the New Republic by ignoring you. 
Now Hera gets only a partial grade here for being able to identify the purpose of her job. Yes, technically, she is supposed to protect the people of the Republic, but you could say that about essentially everyone in the New Republic Defense Forces. What distinguishes a general, and what Hera has repeatedly failed to understand, is that her job comes down to leadership. It's being expected to embody the highest standards of ethical conduct and decision making. It's being responsible for the lives under your command and accountable for the outcome of your actions, not only on the battlefield, but in Senate meetings, on the street, wherever you wear the uniform, or goggles in this case. It's recognizing that in a democratic system, you might not always get what you want, and you might have to carry out decisions you disagree with, and having the maturity in spite of that to understand that is a victory of the system and not a failure. But if the best way you know how to protect the people of the Republic involves ignoring their elected officials, politicizing their military, delegitimizing their civil authorities, publicly bullying those who disagree with you, equating combat experience with patriotism, and undermining the principles of democracy, well, there's a word for that. In Incoming, the Templin Institute discusses the theories and ideas found across alternate worlds. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to join the Templin Institute, consider pledging to our Patreon page. Along with increased security access, you'll be able to vote in polls to determine future topics, get custom wallpaper every week, and receive some other exclusive rewards. Thank you.